at the uh, University of Portland attending a uh, seminar with uh, Dr. Craig uh, Liebenson. And he's come up, uh, he's from uh, LA Sport and Spine and also a well-published author and uh, movement professional. If you don't know who he is, I uh, suggest doing a, a little bit of uh, research there. Um, it's important to me because uh, he's teaching the series on the Prague School to Athletic Development. You've seen me talk about uh, DNS or dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, so he's taken a lot of that information and pieces from other, from other disciplines as well that have similar concepts and putting them together in a, uh, a manner to basically take someone from uh, the rehab portion and actually getting it to the performance side of things. So uh, stealing from uh, FMS, PNF, PNE, a bunch of different areas. Um, and it's important to me as a coach and as an athlete, uh, and I'll honestly say as an athlete because that's, I put this stuff to place. This is what I've been doing from the last few years that's had a dramatic input, impact on, on what I've done on the platform. So one, I've had a lot less injuries and I've been able to move or transfer a lot more power through efficient power transfer and that comes through these methodologies. Um, you know, that, uh, that deep spinal stabilization, positive joint centration, you know, that, that neuromuscular adaptations or lack of, uh, you know, the down regulation that occurs by not having those things in place has a dramatic impact. Taking that away allows you to realize your full potential. And so in this series, like I said, it's a six day series. Um, there's about 35 clinicians in there. So I'm kind of the, uh, the odd man out being uh, uh, the non-doctor non in the room. But uh, you know, it's, it's really useful stuff. So there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of it that I can't use because it is uh, clinical based. And that's, you know, in my world, we're not allowed to do that. Uh, but there's a great deal of pieces that, uh, that I'm able to put in place from my queuing strategies, uh, assessment strategies, and also, you know, I, I take all of this and pull it in to what we're doing at Elite Performance Center in our methodology. So it's, you know, how we're, how we're implementing it in the strength sports is another take on that. And I think that's a, that's a very important note to make because, you know, what we're doing at EPC, the stuff that you see in my videos, there is no one playing that fine line of taking, you know, this proven concepts from that clinical side and integrating them, you know, on the platform, tried and trusted methodologies with, with top level athletes. And so that methodology and approach that we're developing out of this is unique and powerful. And, uh, you know, to get better, I need to continue to, to, you know, interact and learn from the best on that side of the field. And then again, balance that against talking and working with the best of the best from the athletic side of the world. I'm trying to play that middle ground, bring that together and put that in place. One for me and for my athletes. But uh, you know, I, I want people to be better and uh, I believe this is the way to do it. Uh, Craig's been talking about uh, basically the 80-20 rule and some efficiency and and really, this is where this came from. So, um, myself as a uh, as a strength athlete, and something I see in a lot of strength athletes is a lot of shoulder mobility issues, and it happens just as part of our sport. Um, either you think about powerlifting, strongmen, even Olympic lifting, you either have you know overhead pressing movements or bench pressing, and a lot of times there's an open scissor pressing. Um, not necessarily all the times, but with a lot of the big athletes that are they're serious about their, their, they're trying to improve their leverages and get in positions that allow them to move more and they end up lifting with an open scissor. And that is what we, what I see and what I saw in myself, um, you start getting some, you know, that scapula starts locking up, um, starts closing down that, uh, that joint in the, in the shoulder. So we end up with some things that, uh, at least in myself and people I've worked with, uh, you end up with shoulder pain or actually a de uh, less performance because They've got that decentrated joint. And obviously there's a mobility piece of that as well. Uh, I worked with Snell for, for a couple of years on that, improving, improving that with a lot of the stuff that we've used here um, from uh, doing Turkish get-ups, baby, baby get-ups, um, some T4 mobility uh, moves and things of that nature. But uh, started uh, using this tool and then really integrating the concepts that we've talked about here from uh, DNS. Uh, and I'll get into that in just a minute 
um, and how and you'll actually see that come into play. But really, it starts with a lot of times we start with teaching the uh, the levit um, for the uh, the bracing the rib cape position. And so what we're trying to do with this, we're basically trying to move our shoulders through its entire range of motion and actually cue all the supporting muscles that support the the shoulder at the same time having that shoulder plugged into the core. So it's really important that we do that. So um, before doing this, this is an advanced movement. Again, this is for athletes, so I don't recommend that this is something that you, you take out to the general public and to someone that's not athletic. As you'll see, this is a pretty advanced movement. Um, but it's also a problem with athletes. So um, typically I start with an, uh, an assessment, um, doing a uh, kettlebell shoulder uh, halo, make sure that they can move into doing this uh, movement first. And then the first part of the cueing um, of the movement itself is also an assessment. So typically I just have them put this behind their back and then just get comfortable with the pendulum motion like this. So here, if they're not able to get into this position or do this, we're not gonna, we're not gonna move to the more advanced motion. And then we have them work to getting up into the 10 and two position. You can start doing this, pulling it through. You can see now we're starting to cue the lats, subscap, a bunch of the supporting muscles, and then we start moving into the full swing. Notice I'm coming all the way to here, so pulling all the way into position. Once they get the, the motion grooved in, we step to the final step, which is then making sure that they're integrating the ribcage position and the bracing strategies at the same time they're doing this. So I'll lock that in. I should have warmed up, so I made sure I was nice and loose and had everything looking pretty before I did this. But so, uh, that's right. <laughs> I was, actually, I was actually going to suggest that, not from an ego standpoint, but you can actually see yeah. the bracing, the ribcage position really well. So it's not uh, <laughs> <laughs> But it actually, no, it, 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 We can also check out the new tabs. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is a lot more familiar. Exactly. Anybody watch my videos, yes, yes. Um, the other thing that I'm doing, I actually, uh, this is a very traditional movement. And so we're taking a, tra a traditional movement and integrating the, the cueing that we're doing with a lot of the things that we're going over here. I have uh, reversed the grip over the traditional movement. So typically, I'm gonna drop back on this side here. And it would be, I'm dropping back on the, the hand that's the upside. And the reason I'm doing this is on the eccentric phase. I want as much opening that I can get in separating the elbow from the rib cage. And then as I'm pulling through, I've got this hand on the low side because I'm really focused on engaging the muscles on this side. Does that make sense? So it's different than uh, how that's traditionally taught. So again, boom, race, lock in. So you should be able to see. I've got a very dynamic movement but you can see the bracing, you can see the ribcage position, all that locked in, and that's what we're looking for. And this is how we're, we're moving that shoulder, again, through its entire range of motion, cueing all those muscles that actually support the shoulder girdle, and having that plugged in to the core at the same time. So you can see I'm already uh, getting a little bit winded. Um, if I do this a little bit more, I'll be sweating really quick. So from a training efficiency standpoint, it's tremendous as a warm up for basically any workout. Um, because I'm hitting, you know, basically across the board, cueing muscles, engagement, engagement patterns, mobility, and actually accomplishing my warm-up at the same time. I step to this and be able to walk right over to my, my pressing movements, heart rates up, breathing. So it's a, it's a fantastic tool in that method. Uh, had a phenomenal impact on myself. So even with doing a lot of things that we talked about, some of the baby get-ups, Turkish get-ups, um, some of the shoulder reseating drills that, uh, from, from other, other philosophies. I was having to do that every workout and still, have, still having the shoulder pain. I was constantly having to fix it, fix it, fix it. And I wanted to get the, back to the, to the root. Let's fix what's wrong to begin with. Get this working together with this. And uh, after a month of refining the technique that I just presented here, my shoulder pain was gone. 
I had shoulder pain for 10 years. And I have not had shoulder pain ever since. And uh, pretty, pretty similar with the athletes that, uh, that I've gotten going on this. So right now I've got two all-time bench press, actually no, three, I just trained up the third one, all-time bench press uh, record holders uh, that, uh, that are using this tool now as well. So a lot of people interested in it. It's a great tool. Show us one more time. Yep. Now I'm gonna try not to talk too much after this because I was, uh, like I said, I get more wind. All right, so again, I'm gonna drop back on the high side. We're trying to get as much opening and separation of the, on this side while keeping that ribcage in position. So you really wanna focus on that. It's not how deep. I'm gonna try to graze the floor, go as deep as possible on the swing. It's actually gonna help get the momentum out of the, the difficult part of the lift. So, and then you pull all the way down to this position. And then, if you get really good, you should be able to do it with one hand. <laughs> so a couple things about this. Um, like I said, a traditional device. You can go buy maces and things like that. Um, this is made so to use as a standard Olympic plates. You can change it really quick between lifters. The weights load this direction, so there is no risk of ever a, a weight flying off and hitting someone. That was a big concern of mine. Uh, and uh, neural handle, nice flared finish on here so that it uh, prevents it coming, coming out of someone's hand. I did too many there, and I'm completely winded. <laughs> uh, so just a, a, a modern twist, and I really like the, uh, the integration of the queuing concepts and things that uh, uh, the philosophies here has really made a big impact on uh, using it. So it's not just getting a weight and swinging it around. It's not going to net you any gains. You need to be very specific with what you're trying to achieve with it. All right. Thank you. So I think the, the one uh, take home there for, for what we're going to be doing this afternoon, that's the perfect prelude because all of our upper quarter wads are going to be functional unit exercises, meaning we're going to be training not the arm alone in isolation, but functionally integrated training. So they're going to be core exercises while your arm has got the load. So whether it's a stir the pot or a Pavlov press or a chop or something like, like, like the maze, um, uh, the key is that you feel the core, I assume, while your arm is the conduit. Exactly. And that point comes through from, obviously, a very strong individual. And in traditional training, people would be focusing on feeling their delts or something like that. Here, we're focused on the core doing its job as the, as the stabilizer. And then the arm being able to handle all that load with everything staying battened down. Proximal stability, distal mobility. So we'll do easier versions this afternoon, but I hope we get, <laughs> you stay around and we get a chance to try that with the... Uh, yeah, the, I'd, be, I'd like to uh, show a few people. So, that'd be awesome. It's the uh, shoulder rock if anybody's interested. So, cool. all right. So let's finish the. Higher and higher. All right. And a little bit higher, about six inches higher. So you feel that it's just about that it can just follow, come right up over the top on its own. I'm just gonna follow it through, okay? Very close. You got some good sweat on that. Interesting. It's not necessarily that critical because traditional swinging is done the other way around, but uh, that's uh, just the way that I prefer to teach it, so. Oh yeah, that's nice. A little better? Good. Just get a nice tight swing. Good control of the elbows, work it up higher and tuck those elbows through. Beautiful. So we're going to start with that pendulum again. All right, here's your turn. Good. 
Now start working that up higher. Raise the floor, but maintain control. There we go. Okay. Not bad. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's going to be a little heavy, but you're going to be okay. All right? Okay, good. Let's uh, have you face this way so that I can coach both of you guys. Face All right. You face, face me. Yep, there we go. Okay. All right. Now Just don't let work go that of it. <laughs> <laughs> Now start working it higher. She's got it. Less grip. Let the momentum, the product do it. Good. Okay. Now tuck through. There you go. So now you're just going to want to start doing that a little bit sooner. So you're going to start when it's at the bottom of the swing. Okay. Good. Let's stop for a second.